What was that Kennedy family, King family relationship like back then between, you know, uh, MLK Jr., your dad, John F.K. Jr.? What was that relationship like back then? Well, the first encounter was a very important relationship for my dad and my uncle. The first encounter they had um, was in October of um, of 1960 during the election, so it was a month before the election, and my uncle was running against Richard Nixon. Nixon had a very close relationship with Martin Luther King at that time, and um, Martin Luther King had reluctantly joined us. When you say Martin Luther King, you mean Daddy? No, uh, I'm Martin Luther King Jr. Jr. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, not Daddy. King. Daddy Richard King was his. Uh, his, well, I think of Daddy King as his father, gotcha. who was also a pastor. Gotcha. And then Marty, who is his son, who you know is a close personal friend of mine. But Martin Luther, Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Um, was reluctantly joined a sit-in in DeKalb County, and he was persuaded to do that by. Uh, John Lewis and some of the other people from SNCC who were who were taking a much more hardline view than he does. He he wanted to stay out of it, but they basically pressured him into doing it. And the young people, and he was then arrested. He was put in the local jail by the sheriff, but then he was woken up at four o'clock in the morning and put in the back of a police car, and he thought they were taking him to kill him. They were actually taking him to a, a, a prison. Um, and, uh, but they took him to what he called cracker country, and you know, in a place where nobody would be troubled by a lynching. Right. Oh, he was very, very worried for his safety. Coretta uh, uh, was reach out to the White House, I think through Harry Belafonte, who was very close to my parents and who was at that time funding the civil rights movement. And my uncle, Harrison Wofford, who was an aide to my uncle at that time, and my uncle Sarge Driver, went to President Kennedy and asked him to, uh, to call, to intervene. And he was reluctant to enter. They had first gone to Nixon, and Nixon would not return their phone calls because everybody was scared of losing the white vote in the South. And um, my father initially, when when he brought it, when they brought it to my uncle, my father was initially opposed to it. My uncle, before he met with my father, he he um, he called Coretta. King. He was advised not to by Kenny O'Donnell and his other advisors because my father had cut a deal with three Southern governors, including Vandiver, who was the governor here in Georgia, to throw their votes to Kennedy. Um, but they had all said, if you support Martin Luther King, we're going to go with right. Nixon. So both sides knew that, and nobody wanted to get involved. A Sarge Driver persuaded my uncle to call Coretta, which he did. And then my father got furious at, uh, at Sarge Driver, saying, you just cost us the election. My father was at that point at Hickory Hill, which was our home in Virginia, which, was, uh, which became the satellite White House. And he was on his way to National Airport. But on his way to National Airport, he started thinking about it. And then he began steaming about it, about why they were putting him in jail um, for this. And uh, and when he got to the airport, he got the name of the sheriff, and he called the sheriff, and he called and he told the sheriff, "My my brother is going to be president, and if you don't release Dr. King, we're going to remember you." And he called them the judge, and the next day, and he called the governor. And the go Governor Van Dever, he said, can you do something to get Dr. King out? And Van Dever said, I don't think we have any power to do that. And my father said to him, can you do your best and then call me back and tell me what you did? And the next morning, the judge released Dr. King. And he 
I, he knew that it was because of my family's intervention. So they didn't make any publicity about it, but Daddy King then gave a, um, a sermon he was preaching at that time and, say, uh, and told the, the congregation, which was a very influential con congregation here in Atlanta, mm -hmm. Um, that he was switching his vote from Nixon to Kennedy, and that Nixon had done them no good. And my uncle ended up winning the election by the tightest margin in the history of our country, and it was the black vote that put him over. Mm -hmm. And it was because of that incident. And then, you know, during the administration, they, civil rights was not an issue in Boston. And, you know, the politics they had grown up with, it just was non-existent. It was a non-issue. It was on, not on their radar. My father was interested in organized crime, infiltrating the unions and foreign policy and these issues. But civil rights it was a nuisance issue to them because it was... You had all of these new countries in Africa and Latin America who were starting democracies, and they didn't want to give the United States a black eye by saying that you know we had no equality in this right. country. That right. It was a fake democracy right. in this country. Right. So he didn't want you know he, his initial impulse was to ask Dr. King to just. To, to, to not be so loud and not be so vocal and give them a chance and give it time, et cetera. And, um, but then by, this, by the second year in office, they recognized it was the most important issue in their presidency, that and making sure that we didn't get in a nuclear war. And my uncle then worked, or my father worked with Dr. King on a bunch of issues on the on the uh, the business boycott in Montgomery, which my uncle, which my father, then uh, sent Burke Marshall down to referee that uh, the Selma march, the Freedom Riders, when Dr. King called them and said these kids are going to get killed. My father sent 400 U.S. Marshals to protect the buses after the Aniston, you know, after they burned the bus in Aniston, mm -hmm. Alabama. He sent 400 marshals to protect the Freedom Riders, and they realized the local cops weren't going to do it. Right. And they were, just, they were standing by watching the, the buses get burned, and these people, being, these Freedom Riders getting horribly beaten. The Freedom Riders, for people who don't know it, there was a Supreme Court decision uh, which said that uh, interstate transportation could not be segregated. So at that time, the Greyhound buses put blacks in the back of the bus and whites in the front gave them preference. And, uh, and the Supreme Court decision said, if you're using interstate commerce, you can't do that. Everybody has to be treated equally. And the Freedom Riders were a bunch of students who decided to test that law in the South by riding in the front of the bus. Um, all the way through the Deep South. And they, their first stop was in Anniston, Alabama, where the bus was burned, the Greyhound bus was burned uh, up, and the, the students were all beaten, and then they were beaten again in Montgomery while the police and the FBI looked on. And J. Edgar Hoover, you know, was a racist. And um, my father was angry about that and sent 400 marshals in to protect the Freedom Riders. And then the Viola Liuzzo case, which was the murder that happened during the Selma March, um, my father took the lead on. And their relationship kind of culminated with, um, in 1963, when they co-produced the March on Washington. So my uncle and father made sure that they could use the Lincoln Memorial. That was the, you know, there was, I don't know, half a million people who came to the March on Washington. and. Uh, and King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech there, one of the greatest speeches in American history, uh, maybe the greatest. And, um, and then, you know, our families after that just remained closed. My, of course, Martin Luther King was killed two months before my father. He was killed in April. He came out first against the Vietnam War. He came out against the Vietnam War in April 1967 almost one year to the date before he died, he gave this beautiful, beautiful speech that again is one church. of the best speeches in American history. 
and he talked about a lot of the other civil rights leaders did not want him to be vocal about Vietnam because they said, we need to stay in our own lane, we need to focus on this. And he said, you can't separate the two because Vietnam, the cost of Vietnam was bankrupting the war on poverty. And he also said, you know, it's black kids who are fighting the war and they are, and the violence that we're perpetrating abroad against yellow people is coming back to our neighborhoods and uh, and we can't be an imperium abroad and be a democracy at home with civil rights and human rights. Oh, he gave this uh, beautiful, beautiful speech articulating that philosophy and then one year, almost to the date that he gave that speech, he was murdered in Memphis. And my father, who was running also on a peace platform against the Vietnam War, was killed two months later, but the night that Martin Luther King was murdered, um, my father learned about it as he was going into a black neighborhood in Indianapolis, and the, the local police chief said, we cannot go in there with you because there's gonna be a riot. I can't put my men in danger, and you should not go in. And my father went in alone and gave this speech um, about Martin Luther King and told the crowd, you know, Martin Luther King has been shot and killed. And you can hear this, uh, this audible gasp from because it was the first time that many of them heard it. And then he talked very movingly about his own brother's death. It was the first time he had talked about it. And he, you know, he said that a white man killed my brother also. And um, he talked about the need for peace. Um, he quoted Aeschylus saying that our job was to tame the savageness of man, it might make gentle the life of the world. And it had a, a profound impact on that community. There were, I think there were 120 riots that night um, with many cities, including where I lived in Washington, D.C., that was burned to the ground. Southeast Washington was burned to the ground. And that happened in many other cities, and Indianapolis was the only large city where there was no rioting that night. And you know, and that is attributed to his speech. Um, and then you know, when my father was killed, uh, uh, two months later, um, Coretta was with us in the hospital when my dad died, and then she rode on the plane back to Washington with us and with my dad's body. And then she was on the train that we took from uh, New York, from Penn Station in New York, this seven and a half hour, extraordinary seven and a half hour ride from New York to Washington where there were two and a half million people on the train tracks. And um, she sat next to my mother during that period and then our families have just always remained close.